Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash podcast and get CME for this episode by clicking on the CME link in the show notes. Today, we welcome Robin D'Amato. She's a writer and author of the book, Sugar Free, which we'll talk about in today's show. Robin, welcome. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So we'll talk about your book in a little bit. First off, just briefly share your story and journey. Okay. I became a diabetic when I was about seven, which actually mirrors the character in the book. Her journey is different than my journey, but our ages are the same. And a lot of our experiences are the same. But I did cobble it together with some other people I knew because everybody's journey is different. I was a dancer when I was growing up and type one diabetes did not make that easy. But I danced till I was 45 or 50. So it, I kept plugging at it. <laughs> and now I write books. All right. So this particular book is called Sugar Free. And before talking about the book itself, tell us about the events that led you to write this book in the first place. It was interesting because I, this is my third book and I never wanted to write about diabetes. I kind of felt that it was a personal thing, that everybody's experience was different and, you know, many other reasons why I didn't want to go into it. But then I thought of the title. And I thought the title would be perfect. And I thought, okay, what would she do? I don't want to make her a dancer. So basketballs, women's basketball is in right now. <laughs> I'm going to go with women's basketball. I'm a big fan. So tell us, what's this book about? It focuses on Ginny Eastman, who starts playing basketball at the ripe old age of six years old. Her older brother, who is an ex-Vietnam vet, so he's older than she is, had given her a basketball and sort of started teaching her to play, and she just went crazy with it. She just loved it. So it follows her journey. Uh, because then, in, like a year later, he, she becomes diabetic, and completely freaks her out, completely freaks out the whole family, actually. And she, the story is about her learning to deal with it and the changes that go on in treatment, because we're talking about 1966 when she's diagnosed. Mm -hmm. Things are so much different now. So tell her about, tell us about some of the challenges that your main character went through the book in terms of not only the diagnosis, but navigating all the repercussions from the diagnosis at that young age. Well, part of the problem in 1967 was that there was no blood testing. I mean, unless you went to the doctor's office, you couldn't like sit at home and check what your glucose was. Mm -hmm. And if you were doing urine tests, it could be four hours ago that the urine test is, or two hours ago, the urine test is reading and say it was negative. Mm -hmm. It could be a hundred, it could be 40. Your blood glucose could be dangerously low and you wouldn't know it because there's a big difference between a hundred, which is perfect and 40, which is not perfect. Mm -hmm. You, when, it, when the blood sugar is high, of course, you get lethargic, you get you, know, you start peeing a lot, you start, I mean, all sorts of things start going on in the immediate sense. But then, of course, there's the long term, which you have to worry about. So being a diabetic is, especially a type one diabetic, is much harder than people would think, because it's not just about low or high, you have to really aim for the middle. And that's very difficult, especially if you're trying to do anything physical. Because insulin back then would just, you would work out and then your blood sugar would drop and you may, may or may not have a warning. How did your main character navigate her athletic aspirations with the diagnosis of diabetes? First, not so great. She, there were incidents that happened to her early on so that she would find, well, one was a major hypoglycemic moment. She started to learn her body and started to treat not taking advice from other people as much as really re listening to what her body was telling her, which started helping because at first it was, she had no idea what to do. She had no clue. And it was just surprising her all the time. How about her interactions with some of the other characters, whether it's her family and, and friends and tell us about the influence those interpersonal interactions had on her. Well, her she has two close friends in the book, Tilly and Renee. 
in the beginning, they were both basically saying, well, don't you have to do this? And aren't you going to go blind? And aren't you, I mean, people don't always know how to react to you when you tell them you're diabetic, especially when you're a kid, because if you think adults don't understand it, kids really don't understand it. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of that in the beginning until they started getting on board. The more Ginny gets on board with it, the more her friends get on board with it. Her parents, however, were her mother was completely overprotective, especially after she had her hypoglycemic major hypoglycemic incident. It was, you know, following her around, you know, t telling everybody to watch out for her, which was not unlike what I experienced, but my mother wasn't anywhere near as I would say insane, <laughs> as Jenny's mother is about it. But, she, you know, the overprotective thing is, is understandable, but it does start making you insane after a while. You're like, okay, stop following me around. <laughs> so I wanted to get to that in terms of your own experiences. How much of your own experiences is reflected in the book through Jenny's character? The main highlights of my experiences are in the book, the hypoglycemic reaction that had me black out definitely actually there's a point I don't want to give too much away but there's a point in the book where she breaks her leg and mm -hmm. it was not unsimilar to how I broke mine although I wasn't playing basketball at the time <laughs> definitely the when she was having lows that were just at first she could I could me too at first I could feel when there was going to be a low but the longer it I the older I got the harder it was to tell. So I would be surprised all the time. I'd be in the middle of a turn or I'd be jumping across the floor and I'd be shaking. And it would just come on with no warning. So that kind of stuff was definitely parallel to me. Do you have a sense of what teenagers with type 1 diabetes are going through today? Your book and your experiences certainly was decades ago. Do you feel like a lot of those same issues that you wrote about in your book and the issues that you experience as a teenager, are they still present today? I would say not as much. I don't personally know a teenager who is diabetic, but I've spoken to, since I wrote the book, I've spoken to a couple of parents who said that they are having a hard time and that they would welcome letting their teenager read my book. Because uh, I think part of the problem is you feel like you're this strange person and you're all alone and you don't know, you know, and you can't explain yourself to anybody. And I think especially as a teenager, that was really the case with me. And I can't imagine other teenagers not feeling that even today. I mean, the main audience that you want to read your book and the messages the main messages you want them to come away with? I think the main audience would probably be anybody that had to deal with a physical condition that would interrupt their dreams. I think that's a pretty common factor. I think, I think, but it, it, it was really written to be a sto a good story. I really wanted it to be a broader audience than just that. But I think the theme is definitely, you know, that. that no matter if you follow your dream and work on it, you can succeed in some way. Maybe not the way you picture, but in some way. And what are some of the main lessons or messages that you want them to come away with after reading it? If you have a dream, you need to figure out how to do it no matter what your obstacles are, because everyone's going to have obstacles of some kind, whether it's physical, economic, or prejudice, or whatever it is. And in Ginny's case, she was dealing with not only the physical problems, but she was a female basketball player in the 60s. There just wasn't anywhere to go. And then you look at it now, and it, the women's basketball is outdoing the men's basketball. <laughs> But I, I do think it is ma mainly that, that she she was, the character is actually probably much more focused than I was. <laughs> I let a lot of things get to me. And she, I have the character 
overcome that pretty or much earlier than I did. So because this book had a little bit of an autobiographical component to it, had some of your experiences reflected in the main character, did it make this book easier or harder to write in contrast with some of your other books? I think this was easier to write because I did disconnect myself from the main character. My second book was highly autobiographical, and I found that really hard to write. Whereas this one, some of the episodes and the scenes are definitely taken out of my life, but the overall concept of Ginny is her own person. And from that, that disconnect really let me stand away and watch her and see where she goes, which I found a lot easier to write. We're talking to Robin D'Amato. She's a writer, and we're talking about her book, Sugar Free. So, Robin, what do you have planned in terms of the future, in terms of your writing endeavors? I don't have an idea yet <laughs> for the next book. I have a lot of half-finished fin books that I'm going to revisit and see if I can do anything with. Sometimes that's uh, that's actually happened with my last book. I had put it aside, and then I came back to it. The first book was actually Somebody's Watching You, and the second book was Don't Poke the Bear. But Don't Poke the Bear was actually written first. And then I went, I put it aside and came back to it. So I think that is what I'm going to be doing again, going back to things I've started and coming back to them and see if, what I can make of them. Unless something hits me on the head again, in which case I'll jump on that. <laughs> now, did you get a response from the diabetes community after your book published? Yes, not, not as big as I would have liked yet, but it's still early. It was published on May 14th. So it's not quite out in the world yet that much, but people that have read it are really enjoying it. A lot of people are, I'm getting a lot of feedback of people that saying that they're learning a lot, that they want to give it to a friend because such a, such a friend has a, a child or a relative or is themselves diabetic and they were happy to read it. I am looking forward to seeing what the diabetic community says I've, i actually gave a copy to my doctor mm -hmm. and i haven't spoken to him yet. he hasn't he wasn't the last time i saw him he hadn't read it yet so let's see what he has to say and my final question robin tell us some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the kevin md audience i think it's hard when you have a goal and a dream and you spend a lot of time telling yourself or hearing other people tell you that you can't do it for X and Y reason. And I think if you, I think the take home message is if you really feel that you want to do that, that you should go ahead and make it happen. The book is called Sugar Free. Robin, thank you so much for sharing your perspective and insight. Thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.